and we're really happy to have a guest here, Robert DeLong. And he's going to be playing a show tonight. I believe the show starts around 8.30. It'll be outdoors at East Pine, um, weather permitting. And then, uh, yeah, so basically we just got him here. We're going to let him give a bit of a presentation, kind of talk about his musical background, but then also want to open up the floor and uh, take some questions. So be thinking about what you're curious about, what you want to ask. So maybe I'll just start out by saying, yeah, how about, why don't you give us just a little rundown of sort of what your background is, where you're coming from, how, how you ended up where you are right now. Cool, well, yeah. Um, so I guess, first off, kind of tell you, you know, what I do. If you guys don't know, uh, I, you know, I'm sort of an electronic music performance artist. Uh, and what I do is kind of a, you know, a combination of uh, live instrumentation with a drum set, um, and then, you know, various MIDI controllers. Uh, and, I, you know, I sing, I run around, I do looping, and it's kind of like a whole live show, and it creates video, and all sorts of stuff. Um, yeah, and uh, I got started doing this uh, by just showing up, and uh, <laughs> sort of just grew into this massive thing over time. Um, I was, uh, you know, I grew up playing drums. Um, and I grew up in Seattle, Washington. It's a nice place. It looks like this pretty much all the time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, and yeah. So I started as a drummer, and I played, you know, funk bands and all that kind of stuff. But you know, I I, I played formal in school, and I studied music. You know, I studied jazz, um, I studied music theory a lot, I took a lot of composition classes, and that's kind of really where I got my start in, you know, thinking about music kind of from, from this angle as opposed to being just the dude in the back, you know, uh, pulling the band together, which is always a fun thing to be, but, um, yeah, so then, uh, you know, as I was playing in bands, I was recording them, and, uh, you know, I, I was studying recording uh, audio engineering in school, and, um, which, you know, it's, it's funny, because, uh, as you know, you know, studying anything, you guys are all music students in here, I imagine, most of you? No, it's a total mix. Oh, cool, well, uh, cool. Um, I don't know, studying, studying music school is a really interesting thing because you, you learn a lot and you, you, you gain all these skills, but you know, the, there's like so many different worlds of, of making money off of music once you exit school and, and a lot of them are just totally unrelated to, I mean not unrelated, but so different than the way you study music in school. So it's kind of interesting, you know, coming out of that, the sort of formal education system and then going to the real world, which is very, you know, uh, a lot of times you're under people that know literally nothing technically about what they're doing, but they have a sort of array of skills because they've done things for a long time. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Um, so then, yeah, I, I played in bands and, and it, uh, was recording them, and it just kind of grew into a thing where I was producing on my own in my garage, or actually it's uh, Matt's garage. Uh, and uh, yeah, I don't know, uh, he threw me a show uh, at a warehouse in LA, and that was kind of the beginning of everything um, when I started getting his theme, and it was like, you know, it just kind of, it just kind of cascaded from there. Um, you know, getting residencies, playing shows, and that turned into you know, creative management, and then you know, all the other things, and then eventually hooking up Glass Note Records. And uh, you know, once I had a little bit of support, I was able to kind of take it farther. And you know, now I'm touring, uh, playing festivals, and uh, you know, hanging out in airports a lot, which is great. Uh, but yeah. Um, so yeah, if you want, I can kind of just give a rundown of kind of what my setup is, and you know, we'll get we'll get into some technical stuff. I don't know where you guys are in the whole, uh, you know, I guess technical side of, of the whole music production thing, but but, um, but yeah. So my setup is is it's this. There's another bar that comes over here that contains just like a percussion station, it's like timbali, snare drum, you know, a couple like uh, splash cymbals and a, a wood block, and then you know, a full regular drum set. Um, and then uh, this stuff that you see right here, which is, uh, I can kind of go through what each of these things are and, and how they kind of integrate with each other. So starting over here on the left, these are the game controllers, these are like the fun things. Um, you know, got a Microsoft game pad here. Uh, MIDI Fighter, which is kind of a, it's weird about this company in um, San Francisco. And it's just like a, it's a cool controller with arcade buttons, which is getting cool, whatever this, we need samples. But the cool thing about it is it adds gyros, so you can move it around and, that will send many data to do whatever you want in the computer. Um, and then a joystick, which is basically, I use it as a giant XY controller. Um, and again, it's just, uh, I, have, I can show you, in a little bit I'll show you kind of the, the software I use, um, which, you know, makes this possible to integrate to my setup. Um, and then, you know, the old USB drum pad here, nothing too crazy. And then this is a custom controller I had made by Livid. 
yeah, you can see it here, um, which just has, you know, knobs, sliders, buttons, um, and uh, a big knob, which is pretty cool. We like big knobs. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, you know, regular old uh, mini controller keyboard with uh, drum pads. And then uh, down here I have, uh, this thing's plugged in, sure, I'll show you. It's amazing. It's really cool. It's just a mouse, keyboard, and headphone. Uh, Mixer, so really cool. Um, but yeah, so the way this all routes is I have this uh, loom here of the USB and uh, HDMI, which connects to these. The HDMI connects to these uh, little uh, little monitors here, which these monitors are just basically my screens for my computer. Um, I have two computers in uh, this rack over here, and the computers are just two Mac Minis, um, and I run Logic and Ableton, um, and I run this software called Junction which is how I do my mini conversion for all my game controllers over here, which is something you could do in um, Max MSP, but you know, I started using Junction a long time ago and I'm like just starting to get to Max. Um, you know, I will admit that I'm like ignorant to a lot of worlds. Uh, you know, I, I kind of got my thing going and then it's just kind of built on it um, over time. And, and you know, once you get on the road, it's like you never want to try integrating a bunch of new stuff because you have your show, right? You don't want to like just show up one day and have everything not work, which has happened before. It's never fun. It's pretty embarrassing being on stage. Like, I gotta reset my computer, just hanging out. Um, but yeah, uh, so yeah, I guess I can, I can kind of get in a little bit of how all this stuff works, um, how I, you know, use this, this software to, to make music. And then, um, and then yeah, we'll go to questions and kind of go from there. So, um, Kind of the uh, brain behind the whole operation is, is Logic. Um, I'm still in Logic 9 because uh, I use some 32 bit plugins. They haven't even made up grids for them. I don't want to mess around with, you know, doing that thing yet. So, um, so yeah, uh, you can see this is my this is one of my Logic sessions. Um, and you know, it, it's like Logic is sort of my timeline um, where I have you know I have things like audio tracks, just basic audio tracks that have been playing music um, as I and. I don't know if you actually have sound coming through this thing at all. It's probably a big knob, volume. Yeah, we got four. What was that? Oh, we got the wrong. Should be. I mean, it's, I'm getting output here, so. Uh, cool. But what that's going on? So anyway, I have uh, Logic's kind of my basic timeline, but I have Logic send information uh, to uh, an instance of Ableton on this computer. The Ableton on my computer A. Um, so the instance of uh, Ableton on this computer is really just for I have like transitions so I can go between logic sessions so there's never any dead time. Um, and uh, and then on my secondary computer, um, I don't know if you can plug that in there right now. It might take a second to, to boot it up. The second computer is where all the kind of some of the weirder stuff uh, is happening. Um, you know, uh, I run Ableton and Junction on this computer, and then when I occasionally, when I get real excited, I use a software called uh, Delico and I make, which is for um, a, uh, I use a Microsoft uh, Xbox Connect. Um, that's that's been really hard to use because the lighting environment's really changed the way that you can use that. But uh, but anyway, um, I'm going to show you a little bit of what I do in, in the software called uh, Junction. Um, as soon as that thing comes up. Um, but yeah, I have these computers uh, MIDI synced uh, through just Ethernet. Um, I run a MIDI network. Uh, I don't know if, I don't know how many of you are, are, uh, are any of you guys in like the electronic music program know much about that? Yeah, cool. Who, All right. who here produces electronic music? Does some electronic music? Okay, cool. Yeah. So I'm not, everything I'm saying to everybody is not going this good. <laughs> <laughs> People are, gonna, people are gonna know about some things you're talking about. Yeah. Right now, right? <laughs> All good. Um, so yeah, uh, real basic stuff like you know I, I run a uh, a MIDI network between the two computers, um, so I can send you know MIDI data between the computers, um, you know. And uh, so this is the software I use called Junction. Really simple. You have these patches that um, you can find like Logitech X access, you know, uh, and that is over here. I can kind of define what MIDI data it's sending, and then uh, I have these uh, tables that you can look at. Um, literally, uh, let's see how we see it. Yeah, yeah, you can see like these tables, they'll just show, you know, you have different sorts of, you know, curves you can draw for different, you know, these are actually pretty simple things. They're not, 
the way I use this stuff is pretty simple. It's just sending pretty straight normal Moody data. Um, the other thing I use is the Wii remote in this software. Um, and it sends, you know, the same sort of thing. Have it send, uh, it has a gyro in here, so the faster you shake it, the more, the higher the mini values. And then I send, you know, kind of an on off switch for it using the, uh, the B button. Um, and it comes back to this computer over here, which he doesn't have to pull up quite yet, um, which is the, uh, um, which just has kind of all the, um, you know, it just receives all this mini data and it does things to it in logic. Um, and then, of course, I run another instance of Ableton over here for all my live social moving. Um, so I can do things like, uh, We'll see if this is live right now. It's pretty simple stuff, you know. I, I will define. I'll have logic tell this Ableton what tempo and what key we're in, so I can uh, make sure when I make a vocal loop, it's not out of tune the entire time, which is you know nice for everybody. Um, you know, you can do whatever you want. Your loop and something is really fun, you know. And uh, we're not getting that, are we? We're not getting any sound. No. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> no, is it, uh, yeah. Can you can you do a little sound test of making sure that it's not just that patch? But oh, I know exactly what's happening. Yeah. Uh, I just can't remember this thing. The uh, not synergy. There we go. Synergy is really weird. Um, and then the other thing I do is uh, I, I make this real complicated on myself, and I use just one mouse and keyboard for both setups. <coughs> and so I use software to be able to you know kind of move back and forth between the two computers as if they were just two screens on one computer, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, but of course, it's not working right now. That's tough. So can I ask a quick question? Please do that. that. Just like, um, so you have a single mouse and keyboard acting as kind of control for two computers. You have their screens broken out to these guys. Yeah. Uh, what's the advantage in your mind of having sort of two computers run the rig? Is it just to have the ability to process in parallel and run Yeah, the so the whole thing is, is you know, uh, it's really just about DC, uh, DSP content. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's like, I have, I want to make sure that computer, my main computer running most of the, 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 the timeline and the, uh, the tracks out is running well below its processing yeah. limits. Because I've run into so many times where it's, it's not like, I'm never trying, I'm trying to never push the computer too hard, and the whole idea is that when it gets hot somewhere, your computers just start going crazy. Like, you know, I played like Coachella last year, and I was playing this like uh, K-Rock party, which was outdoors, and I had laptops at this point, and the sun was shining down, you know, my computers would always run fine, was, the sun was shining down on the computers, and it was like, it was awful, it, like, turned into like, just terrible glitch sounds, you know, and like, the, the sessions would start to slow down, and you just have to stop halfway through and, you know, make it work, so. I realized that it was super necessary to split my process in between two computers so that that, that never happens. Because no one wants to hear, I mean, like I said, no one wants to see you like halfway through the show, like crawling on stage because nothing works right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, this is not working. Um, well, maybe, I mean, you know, some people are not nice, but um, yeah, I don't know why this is. Did you think it's messing up because I plugged in the. I think it is, yeah. Let me try to turn it off and see if it works. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so, um, I don't know, that's kind of a basic rundown of, basic rundown, it's kind of a, you know, a slightly in-depth rundown of kind of how I, I put all these things together. Um, once this thing starts working in a second, I'm going to show you just maybe a, a couple ways that I use it, um, so you get kind of a clearer idea of what I'm talking about and what it does. Um, there you go. What was that? Uh, comp A? Let's go and throw it into comp A if you want. Yeah, yeah. We'll just leave it there. I probably won't need to show the other one over again. Oh, um, we, got a, we got a quick question over here. Yeah, yeah, please. So, just a quick question. Like, overall, what's your philosophy on, like, how much of the stuff you play live is actually live? Right. Okay, and yes. Then, like, how do you, and is it all, like, the same length? And yes. And how do you handle that? So, this is something that I've, I've, you know, obviously struggled with a lot. This is kind of the big question for every electronic performer. What do you do? You know, and to me, my whole thing is this. Uh, first of all, I want to make sure the show is always cool for people. That's the whole point, you know. People show up and they want to see a show. And especially with what I do, I play, you know, festivals and clubs and, you know, it's really, yeah, so I don't know. So part of it is like, I, I try to make sure it's all repeatable and very, pretty much the same every time in a way. Um, but on the other side, I want to make sure that I'm always doing something and everything I do that people see me doing is actually doing something. And 
and I'm um, actually interacting in that way. Um, so yeah, I don't know, that's, that's sort of where I began. Um, and that comes from watching so many electronic apps and literally having no idea what's going on. Yeah. So yeah, like philosophically, ahead. how do you reconcile that with like being a classically trained jazz drummer? You know? <laughs> That's like why I stopped. Like I used to DJ, and I just stopped going to shows because it's like these guys are just pressing play on Ableton. Right. Well, and you see, know? that's that's where it's you know, and, and, and once you see, if you see my show, it's kind of a, you know, I try to make it as interactive as possible, but also as you know, it's one person up on stage, mm -hmm. and so I get I have a little bit more freedom in that sense to have some a lot of stuff in tracks. But I have the thing I'm playing over it, and no one's going to get mad at you. It's like, what do you want to do? There's no way you can play all that stuff, right? Um, you know, and and that's what I see so many times. It's like you see a band up there, and it's like literally all you're hearing is a CD playing, and and that's cool. You know, it is cool because it's probably still fun for people in the audience. But is it really that? Like, do we need anybody on stage? You know, and that's. I want to make sure that you know I need to be on stage. So I guess the other option is to have like a live band, like Nicholas Jar or something. Right. Like more and, of a live band. And that's really cool too. Um, uh, and I've seen Nicholas Jar do both his live band setup and his like kind of more DJ setup. Um, yeah, you know, and it, that's it, again, that's kind of the world we live in now. It's like we've, we've kind of crossed that threshold where like, especially in America, everyone's like, cool, electronic music. We're like cool with that now, um, <laughs> but we're still weirded out by the fact that. You know, people are maybe not doing anything. Or no one knows, you know. And that's you know sort of the mystery, which is kind of fun. And it's fun to play off of that. But then the other side of it is like you don't want to. I don't. To me, it's like I, I, as a musician, it is hard for me to see somebody not doing something. And so that's why I always do a lot of stuff. At least you know. But you know, a lot of times it'll be like I might make some loops. I'll get it started, and then you know I'll like sing along with this track, and then I'll run over and play drums over what I've done. Um, and you know, then I get to actually play like you know my instrument, my thing that I'm you know good at. Um, and you know, and that's kind of the whole thing is, as a drummer, I kind of treat all of this as a almost a percussion, like a multiple percussion piece. It's like um, you know, I have these different things I play at different times along the tracks, and and it's all very percussive in a way. You know, I, most of what I'm doing is like you know, playing drum pads, playing, you know, timbali, singing, and then like, you know, playing these things, it's like, this is almost, you know, it's, it's, it's a violinist profession, you know, in a way. Um, you know, turning knobs is, I don't, I don't know what turning knobs is, I suppose that's closer to percussion than it is to playing piano, so. Um, and I'm a terrible piano player, but I can do it, so there we go. But, uh, but yeah, um, actually, one second. This is beautiful. Yeah, and so, um, one second, I'm going to make sure that you can get a oh, cool clap sample, right? Um, I don't know why you're not hearing the, uh, the loops that are happening in this thing right now. I mean, it's a sign, some sort of sadness. Let's see if it's actually pointing to the check, check. Oh, that's what's going on. Yeah, we move things around a lot. Airports don't like anything. They like to break everything. Yeah, it's like the first thing if you're ever gonna. So this is real exciting. You guys look at me doing this right now. <laughs> check, check, hey, hey. The life of an electronic musician. Right, right. Yes. Hey, hey, this is great. No, it's still not that great. Woo! Maybe got affection. That's weird. Yeah, the effects are just coming through. I think it's just in the track. But anyway. Um, when you can hear that. Yeah, there's a loop happening. It's just very quiet. Beautiful, though. <laughs> really nice. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just give you a little bit more. You can actually probably just give me a little gain on the, uh, not, not there, on the, uh, on the preamp. Thanks so much, Mick. Yeah! There we go. So whatever. You hear that beautiful auto tuning. So like, you know, so I'll do things like certain points in the set, I'll make a loop, you know, and it'll be going along with the tracks and tempo. And then I have like, you know, I can apply effects to it. You know, do the thing really boring things like beat matching. I mean beat matching. Um, you know, all this kind of stuff. Whatever. Great. Um, uh, and then, you know, at, at different points in the 
in the session I'll have things like turn this down a little bit. But you know, yeah, that'll be good. Cool. Alright, guys, so good. And then I have things like, you know, effect sends on the mics that'll it'll trigger just at certain times. Um, that are you know related to the, the song, you know, and then I'll have samples that change at different times depending on where I'm in the timeline. You know, I try to make it as easy on myself and as foolproof as possible, so I don't have to sit here changing what the sounds are doing what and, and whatnot. And, and then it's like you know I have certain relationships that are set up between you know the samples I'm playing here are side chain against certain elements in the song. And you know a lot of what I do is kind of, especially for the live show, is kind of gravy. So I try to always try to maintain that sort of aesthetic through you know. Heavy side chaining and all the you know sub bass elements and all that kind of stuff. So, do you want to really quickly explain side chaining for those who don't know? Yeah, that? I mean, side chaining is uh, is the, the sound of now, especially it's the uh, when you have like a kick drum hit, everything else gets quieter, so you create that space for the kick drum, and it's you know the sound of like um, uh, you know every song on the radio, you know, um, you know, and that's like I think that in. Uh, 15 years we'll look back on this in the same way we looked on Gated Reverb in the 80s and be like, that's terrible, but I, you know, I love it now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we do that, that's what we do. But, um, you know, uh, so yeah, um, yeah, let's, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so because your setup is so complicated, then how often do you like, add a new track to your repertoire and like lay it all out, like sample it, make sure you have your yeah. Ableton and Logic synced up, and how do you decide which tracks to put in this live setting? You know, it's, it's all been pretty fluid over the years. It's like, you know, as I write new tunes, you know, I'll try to integrate them live. And then it is, it's kind of a weird backwards thing. Because most tunes start for me uh, on a laptop in headphones, like on an airplane or something. You know, I just like make a beat or like I start to make, put a song together and then I'll write lyrics when I get home and record them. And then, you know, eventually it'll come into a song. And then after that, I have to figure out how am I going to play this live. Um, so you never start from this to produce? Well, and that's the funny thing is a lot of times what I'll do is I'll take it to this setup and start to figure out how to play it live, and that'll be before I release the material, and it'll change, with, it'll inform what the material actually becomes in the record. Like, um, you know, the, the songs where I use the Wii Remote, uh, I can show you kind of what I do with that. Um, like, there was a tune, uh, Survival of the Fittest, which was on my last album. Um, which, I mean, in my only official album release, uh, which is on Glass Now, um, which was, you know, I had written this song and it was about 20 BPMs slower and uh, I started performing it live and it was like, well, it kind of, you know, to make it fit in the set, it needs to be faster. And uh, that's when I first started using the Wii Remote and then I went back and kind of recorded what I did with the Wii Remote and then, you know, ended up kind of messing with it and that became the, the actual song. So, you know, a lot of these things, we go back and forth between the live and then the what uh, you know kind of the studio. But as far as what I choose in the set, you know, it's a lot of trial and error. Um, there's a lot of songs that I've tried performing, and, and to me, it's you know, to me, it's not about always having your set sound like what you sound like. To me, it's about making sure the show is fun for everybody. Because that, that's the whole reason that people come out to see you. You know, they're not there to see you. Uh, you know. It's cool if people like songs, and I love being able to play every song for people. But in the end, it's about making sure that the show is fluid and that you know people have something, have a sort of memorable, exciting experience. You know, um, for instance, like what I use with like uh, uh, you know the Wii Remote. Um, kind of what I was saying is, you know, I, I have like a delay, so like hey, so I can catch like a word or something they're saying, and then I can shake it, glitch it out. It's pretty simple. Whoop! You know, that kind of stuff. It's pretty funny. Um, <laughs> that's that for uh, No, yeah, uh, so yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. Um, this is, yeah, this is my setup. So I, yeah, I'm definitely open to questions. You know, I, I can kind of get into to more techie stuff. Um, but I know a lot of you are probably more interested in, in kind of more, you know, broader concepts. Because, you know, I, I think being a Electronic musician is like just this new territory, and everyone's trying to figure out what to do with it. You know, kind of as I was saying before, um, and it's really cool to see. I mean, you know, this is what I do, and it's kind of this weird thing. I see a lot of people doing some really cool stuff. Um, you know, everybody from you know big acts like Disclosure are now you know they use uh, you know like live drums and keyboards and stuff. It's really cool. But the truth is, people have been doing this for a long time. Think about Kraftwerk. You know, that was like they started doing this in the seventies and. You know, their setup is still more interesting than a lot of electronic acts you see now. Um, 
and, and they're awesome. Graphic is great. But anyway, I don't know. Do you guys have any questions at this point? Go ahead. Uh, I wanted to ask, when you're writing a song or even when you're playing like a set, do you think of the different controllers as their own instruments or different sections of, of a band? Or do you sort of figure out, like, okay, this song, uh, this part would work best on this controller, and then just switch all, uh, as, as the song is going. It's totally different. I mean, I think um, one of the things I think about a lot is like, you know, the, like what is the easiest way to use this this thing, and how to, how can that apply to what I do? So, like for instance, uh, let me find a good spot for this. Uh, so. Um, obviously, the keyboard is pretty obvious, you know, notes on a keyboard. But then, like, the, the joystick is like, you know, it's an XY controller. I use it as a pitch controller a lot of times because it makes a lot of sense. You know, you know um, and it's just kind of the natural thing you would do with this. And, you know, like, sometimes I use it so it's like, this is cut off, this is pitch, um, and then I have, you know, something over here. And so I always kind of gravitate towards using certain instruments certain ways. But sometimes I don't, you know, sometimes it's like, you know, I'll, I'll use, like, for instance, this guy, the MIDI fighter, pretty much every time I use this in the set, it's doing something totally different. And to me, it's just about what it, how it feels to use this thing and how you can use that to make, you know, something visually interesting to look at, you know, the way you perform it. And, and then in the end, that's kind of the reason I have everything set up the way it is, is, is to make sure it's visually compelling um, for the audience. Because, you know, again, like, what, it, what I always go back to is, if I'm doing something on stage and there's absolutely no connection with what I'm doing and the music that's happening to you, it's almost not, well, you know, what's the point? You might as well just have it in the track anyway. Um, you know, and it'll be easier on me anyway. That's nice. But, uh, yeah, um, you know, and certain things, like, I can kind of show you how I use each of these instruments in each set. So, like, you know, for instance, like, for the song Happy, I use this as, like, basically just sample controls. Um, you know, you know, it's just like, uh, and you have all, oh, you have all that, yeah. And, and so that's the other thing. Once I show you this, I, I'll talk about how I integrate with the video and how we kind of do that together. That's a big part of the show now. Um, but yeah, and then um, we go to a part of the set where you can see what this does. It's kind of a similar thing. Oh, it's really in the, the session. Um, it would be. We'll get there. Yeah, yeah, so. Yeah. And the cool thing is that the dry roll, so you can do like. You know, uh, as I move this around, I have different effects that change, or it pitches up and down. And, you know, it's pretty simple stuff, and, you know, the idea is to make it kind of as stupid as possible, so it's <laughs> easy for the person watching it to see what's happening. Yeah, go ahead. So, how do you tailor, like, your setup? Do you ever change your setup? Because I know, like, some, like, like, you know, like, you wouldn't bring this into, like, an underground club if somebody was asking you to DJ, like, like, CJs and stuff. You know what I mean? Like, how do you, how do you tailor your music to whatever environment you're playing in terms of your setup? I mean, as far as my set goes, is like, I have my set that is my show. And my show is, you know, different lengths. I have different things for different length setups. You know, I have a different version of the show that I can play without a drum set sometimes. <laughs> so I kind of try to, like, I'd like to keep my show what the show is. Um, and, and, you know, generally, I mean, my footprint's not too huge, it's like I can fit on one of the stages. But if I'm ever doing, like, a DJ set, then I'll show up with maybe a couple controllers. And that'll be something totally different, just playing tunes. Um, I, don't, I honestly don't like doing that stuff a lot, just because I feel like I'm not that great of a DJ. Who cares? I mean, you know, who wants to see a guy that, I mean, I, I understand it's like all about, like, oh, this guy, you know, I'm going to see this guy DJ. But, you know, on, on some level, it's like, you know, some people are a lot better at DJ than me, but no one else can do this thing. No one else knows what the hell's going on. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah. Um, so I guess what I'll talk about a little right now is kind of how I work with Mick, the video guy, and, and kind of how that all came about. Um, so this is Mick Wick Adams. He's a nice guy, video guy. Um, and uh, what we kind of do is, I mean, it all kind of started doing video because uh, we play festivals and I have all this stuff, but, you know, from hundred yards away, this looks like, you know, I'm a dock, and then it's like a bunch of nothing, you can't even see what's going on. So the idea is that we wanted to have 
you know, cameras on everything, so you can get a kind of clear impression of, of what I'm doing and what I'm controlling. You know, so the audience can connect me in that way. Um, and uh, so yeah, that was kind of how we started. What we use now are these. Um, I don't even know what these. I mean, these are like these are for security cameras. Oh, they're for the FPV planes. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, and so I mean, and, and so we have these mounted all around the rig, and as you can see, you know, it's like you know, I have them on each instrument, so you can switch between them. And then I have I send in like controller data, um, which will cue different like I'll I'll make sure, make sure. Yeah. Um, like you can see right here. Oh, I don't, you don't have to switch to that thing. But in a second, <coughs> at this point in the session, it'll it'll cue a uh, video clip. <laughs> And we have, you know, a massive, a huge, system. you know, and oftentimes we'll cue uh, the cameras, so we'll switch between cameras and then cue the video, and then I also send them sound information, which will, you know, he can use to kind of, um, you know, put effect, apply certain effects on uh, different parts of the the video and whatnot, um, and. and and you know that's just obviously that, you know that's part of the whole thing right now is like you know everybody has really integrated video and light shows and and it's really cool because it's really immersive. But then you know to me it was like if we can integrate the, the cameras into that, it makes it you know kind of one step further. And 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 you know it's kind of fun that we do it so DIY because so many you know it, it kind of makes us stand out even though we're not necessarily as big as some of those other acts that are doing stuff like this. So so yeah, um, I don't. Know. Okay. Yeah, from your background as like a jazz drummer and like music theory, then do you ever get tired of like four four and major chords? I mean, how do you <laughs> how do you make up for that? Like, do you throw some weird time signatures in or seventh chords or? Yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. again, for like my set is a lot different than my my albums are. You know, a lot of times, you know, I wouldn't say this is good pop music based, very like you know more s standard format stuff. You know, in a lot of ways, it's like it'll be a song verse and chorus and I'm singing and all that stuff. Um, and then during the set, I have a lot of moments which are more, I guess, kind of like, uh, I have like a jam section where I'm playing drums over a thing for a long time and I'm like doing kind of soloistic stuff where I have like, you know, some really weird like uh, hemiola that turns into the next time signature or something like that. Like a lot of stuff like that, which is a lot more technical and, you know, interesting for, for musicians, and I think everybody else is like, that's cool, it's, he's doing something complicated, I don't know what it is. Um, and that's cool, you know, and, and for me, that's, that's like important to me, because otherwise, I, like I said, I get bored on stage, and, and you know, I make the drum parts just hard enough that they're always hard, which is good. Um, uh, yeah, um, you know, and, and really, all this comes down to, it's coming, you know, it's coming out of, like I said about, what did I said, 20 lines in total now? 26 lines? 26 for the over 60. 26, 30, 30, yeah. So, um, really, I mean, I work really closely with, this is Matt, my sound guy, or I don't know if you have a here. And, you know, we work really closely together because, you know, as you can imagine, electronic music it's not has nothing to do with how great your instrument sound necessarily. It's exactly what's coming out of the speakers. You know? If you stand on stage with me, I'm all self contained in my monument system. If you stand on stage with me, it just sounds like a dude who, like, whooping and hollering. And, and like you hear like he play drums sometimes, and that's it. That's all you hear on stage. And then you know, obviously, it's it's like absurdly loud out there in the audience. So, um, so yeah. Go ahead. How do you determine which festivals to play at, and would you ever be open to performing at festivals, say in Latin America, in the Middle East, an African continent? Definitely. I mean, I, I would love to do a lot of that. I mean, you know, really, the way it, it kind of comes through is I have you know a booking agency. And you know we get offers for different things, and if it works routing-wise and it seems like a cool thing, you know that's the way it works. Um, I played South Africa, which is really cool. I've done a lot of shows in uh, Australia. Yay! Um, which is really amazing. <laughs> I love it. Australia is really. I mean, just because Triple J is a great radio station here, yeah, yeah. it's really supporting. <laughs> Sorry, I know Triple J in Australia. Oh yeah, yeah. No, that's great. Right. Yeah, no, they uh, they've really supported uh, my tunes a lot down there, and so that's gotten me down there a lot, um, which is amazing. Um, but yeah, I mean, I would love to go. I just, like I've always said to my booking agency, like let's, let's get to South America as soon as possible. You just have to have. Hello. The tough thing is, you know, yeah. it, it's not cheap traveling and other stuff, and so you have to, you know, make it monetarily worth it. Because I, you know, as much as I want to do really cool, 
underground strange things, at some level, I can't just waste all my money doing it. Oh, not waste all my money. But you know what I mean? It's like, I have to find a way to make this financially viable. Um, and I'm, I'm an idiot for making my uh, setup so complicated, to be honest. I mean, it's like, if I just played flute, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I mean, that's a huge thing. I mean, I, would love, I, mean, I, I want to go everywhere. I mean, uh, I would really love to go to Japan, um, which is someplace I haven't made yet. Um, hopefully, we'll film this next record cycle. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of the funny thing is, you know, coming at it from, I've always been kind of a, you know, nerdy music tech guy, and then coming into the other side where it's like, you know, I'm a, I'm a performer and a, uh, a, you know, I have to kind of be a business person now. It's kind of a weird thing, you know, being on that side of it. Um, but, you know, it's cool. It's interesting. Okay. So, how do you determine, like, what you need to piece of gear and more of a person that you have? Well, I guess it's kind of like that's kind of that trade off of how you Yeah, I mean, um, it's all, you know, it really comes down to when I start to get bored with things. <laughs> and it's like, I want, I want something else to be able to make the show more interesting for me and, you know, other people too. Um, but then the other side of that too is, uh, you know, as I add new songs, I want new elements to be able to introduce. Um, and so, like, I have, like, a guy that's helping me make a uh, weird, like, um, I don't even know how to pronounce it. Is that Oddness Martin? Martin, 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 Martin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's helping me make like a kind of weird digital version of it, which is like going to be a little bit more, it's like going to be a lot stupider than that, but it's, you know, it'll be cool. Um, and, uh, you know, stuff like that. Well, like, for instance, like this this thing right here, um, this Gibraltar rack, uh, this just came to play about a month ago or a little bit less than that. And it's literally just hit Gibraltar, you know, and they make like drum racks. Um, and said, I need, I need something that you know looks cool and it's going to be grown really. We were touring with pipes from uh, literally uh, like Home Depot that we were like, and it was cool. It was actually you know it was cool that we did, you know made it work and that was really that was really Matt's idea from start to finish and it was good and it really did a lot. Um, you know we just had like uh, some uh, it's like a conduit pipe or some sketch. Uh, oh yes, yeah, sketch yeah, um, and it was just you know screw it on there and we get like uh, drum clamps and clamp all the hardware on there. But, you know, at some point that's too heavy and this is nice because it's designed for, you know, musical instruments and, and yeah, so wheels, wheels are about the best thing in the world when you're touring. So, so yeah, but yeah, boredom, that's how you end up with more stuff. <laughs> hey, uh, you talked about it a little bit before, but can you talk about like if since, uh, some of your equipment does like fail if you're having technical problems, how you adapt your um, kind of performance and in your stories. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, I mean, really, you know, I've had every, pretty much every piece of equipment fail at some point. Um, and then, you know, a lot of times, I mean, really what it comes down to is you have to practice a lot. So you know when that thing fails, what can you do to either make up for it or whatever. I mean, the worst that's ever happened is I've had maybe two shows, it hasn't happened in a long time, or I have to just like get on the mic and like be like, hey, sorry guys, I'm just gonna like tell jokes for like five minutes so I can figure this out. Um, but uh, other than that, it's pretty much always, you know, I've always found a way to make it through the set. I think the worst thing that happened was in, uh, for me and Matt was in South Africa when, uh, that was the worst. It's, uh, yeah, was the worst. <laughs> for me, it sounded like the worst. It was like, uh, I had this like, I, I just somehow created a mini feedback loop and it was like, I hit a hi-hat sample on my drum pad, and it was infinite hi-hat samples on my drum pad. And it was just like, just like, it went from like, you know, a song's about to start to like, it's just like the sound of death. It was just like, make music Pasadena. Oh yeah, then one time make music Pasadena. In Pasadena, uh, it was really sunny, and my computers were just flying, and we had to. But it was that it, it uh, I didn't even know this was possible, but as the computer slowed down, it started pitching down the audio. Yeah. So it was like you were like losing like samples and it was like. Like it was degenerating really, but also pitching down against the vocals. So it was just like. So weird. So the vocals sounded <laughs> possible, it was very. It was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, you know, that's, you, you live and learn, and you get faster computers, and that's why you have two computers, and that's why the Mac Mini is in the rack and all that. I wonder if you can talk a little bit about how you get the idea for songs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, songwriting is kind of totally separate of my whole tech part of this, you know, in a way. It's like songwriting is something that, you know, I came to a lot earlier on and it was just, uh, 
you know, I've never been a, um, the kind of person that like sits down with an acoustic guitar and writes like relationship songs. I mean, I've done that before, but it's not really my thing. Um, I don't know, for me, like, as far as musical inspiration, it's just like I just try to listen to lots of music and, and, and then, you know, it'll be like, I like that kind of thing, I want to emulate that. And then once you start emulating it, you realize it has nothing to do with what you started with. So for me, I always try to find inspiration from something else, and then you end up with something totally different. Um, Can you give a couple of examples? I'm just curious. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I'm trying to think of like some really specific things. Like, um, it was like, uh, think about, I mean, something that was really simple is like, uh, for my last album, my, my single was uh, Global Concepts, which I've played so many times, I'm already sick of it, but. Uh, <laughs> It was like, you know, it was, I, I started writing that tune right when like people were like, Moomba Tone is going to be the next thing. It's like, ooh, Moomba Tone, 108 BPM, I like that, it's groovy. And so I just, I started writing a tune around it. And the funny thing was, it was like, everyone's talking about Moomba Tone as like this like wacky thing, but no one was really making, there wasn't that much uh, Moomba Tone that wasn't just like dubstep at 108 BPM, as opposed to people making kind of like, you know, groovy Latin stuff with like, you know, messed up, uh, you know, triplet rhythms and kind of that whole like, you know, Timbali, you know, that whole thing. And so that's what I tried to do with that. And it ended up being, you know, kind of what it was. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's movie tone by definition because it's one way of EPM or whatever. Um, uh, and, you know, that's, that's the way it happens a lot. Like, it'll be, you know, I'll be, like, listening to a Brian, e Brian Eno record and be like, I love the way that ambient piano sound is. And, you know, I'll, like, try to make something like that. And then it'll end up being, like, a drum and bass song. So, like, but, um, I don't know, and that's, that's the way it's like, to me, if you get started, and this is the way I've always treated anything, you know, creative, it's like, if you get started on something, you'll end up with something, right? And if you can just always just keep getting started on things, you'll find something cool in everything you're doing. Um, and then, you know, as far as, like, lyrics and, and melodies and stuff like that, you know, I, I, like I said, I studied, I studied music in school, and so melodies I tend to get pretty clinical about. You know, I, I will think about you know, different ways you can do a melody and try to make it as, uh, try to just create variations on things. Hey, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's Daniel Glass. That's the man. <laughs> He's not here. Um, yeah, and then, you know, lyrics, lyrics are a weird thing. Um, I don't know. Do any of you guys, like, do songwriting at all? You guys write songs? Yeah. Cool. Um, yeah, lyrics are, like, to me, like, the weirdest thing. It, uh, for me, lyrics are always just start with sounds and then you find like some words that sound good, and then I will start trying to apply the things I'm thinking about uh, to create a structure. You know, and usually I'm thinking about like you know popular science, so maybe not things that people relate to that much, or like you know like Isaac Asimov. It's like uh, you know a lot of I like love sci-fi, so I'm always trying to find ways to sneak in sci-fi ideas into you know a pop song about I don't know, something to love. Um, so you said you're like specific about melodies. So do you worry about counterpoint and stuff? You know, sometimes I, I get like I, I find myself doing this all the time, especially when I'm writing synth parts. I will get I will get stupid and be like, oh, I can't do parallel fits here. You know, I'll like do all those stupid things, and then I'll be like, wait, 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 wait. no one knows or cares. Like, <laughs> so, it's like, so it's like that weird, you know. And, and that's the whole that's the whole thing of being a music student. It's like that amazing thing of like now you have all these skills that make everything fast and easy to do, but then the other side of that is like you're stuck with all these rules that don't exist. Like, there are no rules, right? I mean, like, there are rules in the sense that you know now how to make things sound good fast. And that's the great thing about going to music school and understanding those things. But especially for, you know, pop music, commercial music, that whole world, the rules are only as useful as, 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 as tools that are, are something that keep you somewhat fast as opposed to the, uh, the end all be all, you know. Go ahead. Have you ever sort of just like sat down like jammed on your rig, like not without any composed beforehand? Totally. I mean, that's how I ended up with eh, probably two or three songs on the last record. Um, and yeah, it'll be like, you know, I'll just start by making like a drum loop and then, you know, building some stuff on top of it and, you know, just, uh, you know, jamming on my effects mic, making these kind of weird ambient melodies and then, you know, attaching lyrics to those things and eventually it becomes a song. Um, yeah, that's a really cool. That's a cool thing, and that's something I'd, I'd love to do more. The tough, the really tough thing about everything is that this whole setup is, as you can see, cumbersome. It's not like I can just show up in my hotel room and set this up and be like, just jam, you know. Um, it's kind of a, it's something that I have to be very 
specific and intentional about. Um, and you know, also, oftentimes too, like I said, being clinical about the way I think about melodies, I find that it's easy for, easier for me to write when I'm sitting there in headphones and just like, you know, listening to a loop and, and testing out different melodic ideas <coughs> and, you know, trying to then attach any ones that I think are the most, um, I guess, universal or, you know, easy, broader, or easy to understand. Um, you know, and that, that's the funny thing about pop music is everyone says like, oh, pop music is like the hardest, like the easiest thing to write, you know, it's just like, oh, it's all the same, whatever. It's the hardest thing to write, I think, or it's all very hard to write. It's always harder for me to write that than something weird, because I can write weird stuff all day, but to try to find something that connects to more people than not is, I think, difficult, and you have to know what's going on now, but you also have to know what people don't know. You know, I think it's, it's kind of, it's, I don't know, it's like, that's the big, I think the biggest mystery. Um, so yeah. Do you feel like your artistic is kind of needed by the music to provide the audience or something that they don't think I like? I don't know. I mean, I think that I always have, I, I try to always create some space for me to be weirdly creative in some ways. And, you know, for every 50 ideas I make, I think people hear maybe 10 to 20 of them at the most. You know, I, I think I make a lot of music just for me, but knowing that if I'm making a song just for me, it doesn't mean that anybody else wants to hear it or needs to hear it. You know, that's more about like, this is catharsis for me. And then like, you know, if I'm gonna, especially because, you know, what I do is on, and in the end, you know, I'm, I am selling product, right? I mean, that's what going to a show is. You sell tickets to a show so that people, you know, everyone has a good time. That's the whole, that's the end goal. But, you know, on the other side of that, it's like, you wanna make sure everyone has a good time. You don't wanna make it just like, I was up here being a weirdo the whole time and no one knows what was happening, you know. Um, I don't know. So that's, but that is, you know, that's kind of the weird thing. You know? Again, coming out of like music school and, and, and the whole, you know, art music thing. It's like making music just for music sake, just for art sake, and that's very cool to me. Um, and 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 again, like I said, like I like doing that. But like on the other side of that, it's like I like, I love, you know, connecting with good people and and partying with people, and that's kind of part of my whole thing is. Um, if you could get uh, drinks with one contemporary musician and one uh, composer or musician from another era, which two would you choose and what would you talk about? That is a good question. <laughs> uh, I could drinks with contemporary musician. I, I don't know if Brian Eno counts as a contemporary musician. He's still alive. He's still doing, I mean, he's still doing plenty of work. Uh, I've always been a huge fan of Eno. Um, so yeah, I, I'll, go with that. I'll go with that. Um, as far as somebody dead, I don't know if Bach drank, but I'd love to hang out Bach because, I mean, Brian, you know, obviously I talked to you about production and, and kind of like, you know, the, uh, the, like, you know, the advent of ambient music and how he contributed that. Because that to me is like his biggest contribution. That's something that's really, I don't know, to me that was really important. Um, and then Bach, I don't know, Bach is just, it's the man, just kind of like, <laughs> you know, that's that harmony of, of, of math in music, but then also, you know, still creating something beautiful and accessible. Just how, you know, I just love to hear him talk about how that happened, you know. Um, and then, yeah, that's a great question. Do you ask that to everybody? It's <laughs> 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 a good one. Uh, I don't know if this is a touchy subject, but what do you think about like Molly at the shows? Like, does that enter into your conscience at all? Like, that people people doing fraction, drugs at shows. A large fraction of the people are just cracked out and they're. Yeah, no, I know it's weird. Well, that's the kind of weird thing is I I, I played both the very rock oriented festivals and the very like you know EDM crowds. And to be honest, I actually enjoy the rock festivals more because people are more attentive. They're not there just to get blasted. And like not remember it, but <laughs> but then the other side of that, it's like you know I, I have no I uh, without like you know I, I have no I, I'd say I'm probably very libertarian in my view of like people do what they want be safe about it you know um, but there is the other side that's like oh but it's like kiddos that are it's too young to know what they're doing and like I don't like that you know and I wish I wish there was a way. You know, if if, th if these things were, were legal and regulated, it might be easier, but it never will. You know, it, and, and there will never be a way to make it safe and easy for everybody. So I don't know. 
I don't know what I think, honestly. I do feel weird about it sometimes, because I'll be like up there like rocking out, and I'll have a good time, and I look out, it's like, that person is like, I'm worried for their health, like someone's in the water or something, you know? Um, but I mean, I think that's the way it's always been with musicians, you know, you always find yourself in those, people enjoy music in heightened states, always. Um, and, and you're always in a heightened state when you're enjoying music. It's just part of the body's natural reaction to music, I think. Um, and so people always want to supplement that, I think, natural. And so I think it's sort of this weird tension of like, you know, when does it become self-destructive? And I, you know, I, I can't really say anything about that. I'm just the guy up on stage. And I can, you know, tell people to be safe. I don't know if that's really going to change their minds about anything else. Um, yeah, no, I don't ever get on stage and like, yeah, where's the Molly bro? <laughs> but, um, um, I don't know. I hope that, I don't think that answered the question. But. <laughs> uh, do you have any particular control of that? Like you're really excited about right now? Is that most fun? I don't know. I mean, I, I just got this like uh, you know five months ago. I love this thing just because it's like it just feels really nice. It, like, feel, like all the action of everything is just really comfortable. The other side of it is it, it's kind of like. Uh, it's like falling apart like four times already, so that's not that cool. Um, but I don't know. Um, what I'm really excited about is, is kind of the future of creating custom things, like having people create custom things for me. Um, and you know, now that I feel like I have the resources to make that happen, I'm super excited about that because that's always been kind of you know the goal in a way. But you know, the other thing is like it's super fun to take you know common household devices, household devices, but you know things you can find anywhere and turn them into, you know, this tactile interface. And, and, and the reason I always gravitated towards using game controllers is, you know, I was never a huge gamer, but I was still better at Tony Hawk than I was at piano. And it's like, you know, I, I find it more, I find it's more comfortable for me to play music with a joystick, and I find that it's more natural for me to play it with the joystick than it is for me to even play on a keyboard. Because I was never really, I mean, you know, happy to pass my piano proficiency, and I barely did. Um, but that's about it, you know, and so that's kind of why I like this. And, and for me, it's kind of like, too, you know, I see so many times I'll see, like, like young kids that come out to shows, and afterwards, they're like, it's so cool to use video game controllers. It's like, oh, I want to do that. It's like, well, don't do that necessarily, but, like, that's cool. It's inspiring for people to kind of see that, you know, music doesn't have to be this thing that everyone is, you know, kind of, it, you know, it doesn't have to be this formalized thing. You don't have to have the right equipment. There's no such thing you can um, earlier on, you, you kind of, well, you, you kind of rolled your eyes at the like the dubstep live glitching and um, side chaining. Are there any ways that you pushed against conventions that you're particularly proud of? I don't know. Uh, it's funny that I roll my eyes because I do all that stuff. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, and and uh, but I don't know. I mean, I do all sorts of weird production tricks that I don't even know if people are doing. You know, I do a lot of. Um, you know, and side chaining is one of those things that's, you know, people have been side chaining since the 60s, you know, uh, and just using it in very subtle ways that make a lot of sense, you know, you have a voice and a saxophone that are in the same range, uh, when the voice is singing it makes the saxophone a little bit quieter, you know, um, but it's not an effect, it's a, it's a practical mixing use. I'm trying to think of some weird things I've done that, um, I don't know, I mean, to be honest, as far as my music production goes, it's like, I have very quirky ways, I think, that I approach certain ways, like create synth lines and stuff like that, or certain sounds. But as far as production goes, you know, I'm not, I'm not like, you know, I'm still using, you know, Waves R comp for my side chaining. I'm still using, you know, I'm, uh, I'm still using Dune and Massive and, uh, you know, Xylent like everybody else. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I think the thing that I always try to do is to take sort of Things that I like in, you know, rock music, indie music. You know, I'm a huge Talking Heads fan, and like that kind of like layering vocals and that kind of stuff, and taking it to the electronic world. And I think that's fun to like mess with people that way. Um, but as far as like, uh, yeah, I don't know. I haven't done. I haven't invented too many things yet. So, <laughs> um, so what's your process um, behind um, the patches and the sounds that you use? Do you do you sort of hear a sound and then try to craft something using whatever plugins um, that, and get as close, close as you can to what you're hearing? Or do you just go through a whole bunch of patches and be like, yeah, that's, that's the one that sounds best with, with the song? 
Totally, yeah, it's just totally, totally dependent on what I'm doing. A lot of times it'll be like, I want this kind of sound, and I'll open up the synth and try to get there, or I'll try to find a preset that's close enough and then, you know, tailor it to get there. But more often than not, when I do that, I end up with something I didn't intend, you know, which is usually probably more interesting than if I had gotten exactly what I was looking for. Um, but I think that's the way that most people work in electronic music. It's, it's kind of cool that it is so, you know, it's just this open world in a sense. People, you know, there's no, there's, we've kind of transcended this, like, there are, like, these kind of instruments that do these kind of things. It's just, you have sounds, and you use them however you want, and then you have drums up your way. Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, can you kind of just take us through the process of when you like prepping for a performance in terms of your like when you sit down with your creative team and say this is like the set that you want to do but you want to incorporate the different like video graphics and sound graphics and like how you incorporate new or emerging technology and your personality into into it all? Sure. I mean, you know, I, I gotta be honest. It's like most of this most of the work happens, you know, me alone uh, in my you know my like garage studio um, and just spending a lot of time, you know, I like have a new song I want to try out, um, and so I'll make a session that's just that song, and, uh, you know, go through it and, and start to figure out, you know, which controllers I want to use, which would make sense, you know, it's like, for instance, let me, uh, let me pull up, I don't know if you can switch over to the, the thing, this thing, the, oh, I'm thinking, sorry, um, yeah, just, just the, uh, there. But uh, you know, it'd be like, like I got a new tune, uh, long way down, and I was thinking about like, well, what I what thought would be really cool. Oh, let me put this in the uh, right part. It kind of what is that the yeah that's right. Um, it kind of fe you know the song kind of features this like uh, vocal glitching thing. And so I was like, well, how would I, how would I make that something I could perform live as opposed to just, you know, having these vocal glitches play? Um, and, you know, I was like, well, I'll have, I have the secondary microphone, which is my effects mic. And uh, I thought, well, maybe it'd be cool to control the pitch of that with uh, my joystick. So let's see if that's good. Hey, check. Yeah, yeah, you can't really hear that when we turn it up so more. Yeah. Long. Yeah. 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 Like, you know, and then it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, I have octaves. Yeah. Oh. And then, you know, I control the Because that's basically the effects I was using on the computer. And so that was like the whole idea is I wanted to emulate that. And then I have a track going. And then, you know, at some point, it's like, you know, it was just, you know, a lot of times it's really just me going through and finding things that I can play that make sense. You know, I have a piano breakdown, so I play the piano at that point. Um, you know, and then it goes to drum set at one point because that's the thing that makes sense. And then it'll come back to, I'll get together with Nick at some point in our lives and we'll, I'll be like, what, what do you think would be cool for video content? And he pulls up some, yeah, <laughs> and then, uh, and then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, Nick, Nick makes like, he, he just has tons of weird stuff and we just kind of go from there and, and, you know, I send him video cues and it's really not, it's really organic, I guess, the way it works. There's no, it's like I have my specific ways of doing things, and a lot of it I can't even describe, you know, why or how I think this way. It's just the way I am, and that's why things end up this way. Um, yeah, there's no, I don't know, I wish I, I wish I could be more specific. There's really no rhyme or reason. It just, things happen, and then once they've happened, they get together with Nick, and more things happen, and then I get together with my sound guy, and he tells me it all sounds wrong. <laughs> I noticed when you were on the mic and you had some latency. Yeah. So like, oh, yeah. how do you like? What's your latency that you can deal with and still like play the drums at the right time? You know, you know I, I try to keep. Uh, I keep logic. Um, I don't know if, uh, how much. Yeah, I don't know. I, I keep logic. I try to keep logic as. Uh, you can you can turn on this thing in logic where there's, um, it'll just assign whatever latency is your plugins to everything. Um, that, that, so it's like, for instance, like if I'm playing an instrument, uh, it'll have you know almost zero latency. It'll be like probably like, you know less than five milliseconds or something for my you know sounds on this you know on the drum pad. But then you know if I have a lot of plugins on my uh, two track, uh, that might be rocking you know up to 150 milliseconds of latency. But it's like I'm playing over that and it works out. It's all fine. Um, 
this one specifically is up. I'm using AutoTune plugin. Those are really. I need to get the new. I need to like buy the new. Uh, they have an AutoTune Live plugin, which is probably the one I should start using because that's like that's supposedly zero latency. Which is, you know, there's no such thing. But you know, it's like it, you know, I, I've seen people use the live, and it's you know, it's it's there. It's 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 inaudible the, the, the latency. But that is like the the big battle in, in electronic music. You know, I have so many songs where it's like. Like I'll have like my kick drum over here on my slider, and it'll be. I literally have to put it up. You know, in my mind, it's like an eighth note before the thing comes in every time. You know, yeah. and that's cool. It's fine. You know, you just learn to deal with it, and that's just the nature of this thing. And you know, as time goes on, those things will get smaller. But the problem is, we can't. You can't perform in the future. That's the whole problem with all of this. That's the whole problem with like, you know, electronic music is so about you know those really sharp hard cuts, you know, that's so much of the thing that people do. And those kind of things are really so hard to achieve with, you know, human tools. Because humans are, as you know, a lot less accurate than, than that. And, and then when you have, you know, when you introduce things like latency, then it's like, it's not natural for you to be, yeah, I'm rocking, but I'm actually rocking an eighth note ahead of everybody. <laughs> it's really weird. Uh, so no, that is kind of the, I've thought about that a lot. What is the, the way to make that amazing? And I don't know what the answer is. I think it's to make robots that are good at stuff. I don't know. But. What's that? Um, what would you say up to this point was, has been the high point of your performing career? Ooh. Like the moment on stage that felt like you reached a critical mass and you were conscious of it in that moment? I don't know. I remember like, I mean, the first time I performed for more than a few hundred people was, uh, I did, uh, I don't know, Pearl Palooza actually, up in, that was like two or three years ago now, almost. Um, that was for, I don't even know, like four, five thousand people, I have no idea. But I remember at that point, I was like, wow, it's crazy. Like, um, like, this, is, this is something happening. But it was, about, it was about a year and a half ago, I played Splendor in the Grass in um, Australia. And that was a really cool thing because it was like I'm like I'm on literally the other side of the world, playing for thousands of people who like know some of my songs. That's crazy. Like that seems absurd. That would even happen. And it was like sort of like at that point, you know, it's kind of like after that, I was like, wow, I, just, I, need to get, I need to get better at stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Um, where do you see yourself in the next few years? Say, like, in the music career, do you see yourself like? I think that, you know, the hope is to obviously, you know, continue to expand, you know, the, the size of the audience and, and to continue to put out new music and new kind of, find new creative, you know, to me the goal has always been to try to find new creative ways to make something, um, to make, you know, pop music weird and then to do, a, you know, a kind of a cool performance with it. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I've never had like any like specific goals, like numbers. Like I want to play for eighty thousand people. Um, so I don't know. But just to continue, continue trucking and, and uh, you know, defer to the beautiful team at Glassnow to, to help me, you know, get there. Um, and then the other side of that is, you know, like, you know, obviously at some point I'll be too old to perform. Um, so I really do want to get in, you know, to more and more working with other people as a producer and, and helping people from that aspect and, and that's something that I've you know done a little bit of now and I'm, I'm kind of learning how to work with people. And that's kind of an interesting thing. It's, it's not so much about you know I, I've always been alone up here doing my thing. Um, working with people is a totally different thing. It's actually it's more psychology than it is you know um, being good at stuff. I, I've met so many people who have zero musical training that couldn't tell you the name of any notes on any instrument but are still amazing writers and um, and that's something, I don't know, that's kind of an interesting learning curve is realizing that, uh, you know, that there's, there's so many ways that you can be involved in this music thing that have nothing to do with what you might have traditionally thought. So, yeah? Are there any people who really don't have it right now? A lot of people. Um, I, don't know. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if anybody... I've, I've always... Uh, Flume is one of the people I've always really wanted to collaborate with. I really love this, this kind of thing that he's been doing. Um, he's 
about one of the newest producers that I've like, really latched onto in the last few years. I really love people like um, Donato Dazi and like uh, Lucy. That's all like techno stuff out of like Germany and, and Italy. And that's cool, but that's sort of outside of my genre. Um, so that's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, I would love to do stuff with them, but it wouldn't be Robert DeLong, I would imagine, you know, so. Why do you use Ableton and Logic instead of just Ableton and just Logic? Why do I use Ableton and Logic? <laughs> uh, because I know Logic very well and I'm super fast in Logic. Let me show you something terrible. Uh, so this is the environment window where like all, where people use Logic go to die. And it's like, it's like, um, it's kind of like Max NSD create like patches which are these like, you know, transformers. Really pretty simple ideas, you know. Take controller information, you modify it, and then you can you know, change the mapping. Yeah, it's meant to do some weird stuff. You know, and draw on your, the way your transformations work and stuff. Um, let's close this so I can save that. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, so I've gotten, I, I just, I've used Logic for over a decade now, so I'm just super fast with Logic. And that's the whole reason I've always used it as my brain. And slowly I'm switching over to Ableton and learning Ableton more. Um, I don't know, it's, uh, I really need to learn Max and that, then I feel like, I don't know, it's <laughs> yeah. 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 Any more questions? Any, anybody else? Let's take one more question. What's next on the, on the radar? Like, is any new releases coming out? Or any yeah. New music? <coughs> uh, I have a new EP coming out November 10th. November 10th. November 10th, still. Um, I'm excited. It's got four tunes on it, um, and it's going to be cool. And uh, on after, I mean, tomorrow I'm playing at CBGB's Festival in uh, Times Square, and then after that uh, I'm on tour with uh, St. Louis on the West Coast just for two weeks. And then, you know, hopefully finishing a record. You know, hopefully, definitely finishing a record. Uh, sometime, probably March-ish next year, I'll be releasing that record, so we'll see. You know, I keep looking. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mean, that's that's sort of what's next. Um, it is, yeah, it kind of going back to that though, it's so interesting. Like, I have people working with me and for me, and I've sort of worked for in a way, and it's such an interesting thing now. It's like, you know, uh, self reliance is no longer even an option, you know, when you have so many moving parts to the thing. So it's cool, it's, it's fun to have, to have that, like, you know. Have like goal oriented uh, work is nice as opposed to just, you know. Go ahead. Uh, I don't know if you can do this, but can you play one of your non like 4 4 productions that's like unreleased, like one of those 50 tracks? That's like. Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, honest, there's literally nothing on this computer because this is all my like track stuff. Um, I don't know. Are you going to be the performance later? I didn't know there was a performance. Yeah. It's a performance. Uh, eight, yeah. Thirty. So eight thirty tonight. Hopefully outdoors. What's the rain in case of rain? It looks like we're still outdoors. We're still outdoors. All right. Yeah. So eight thirty. It'll be right outside East Pine uh, awesome. Pine Library. Gonna be really fun. Yeah, come check that out. You'll see yeah. some some of the stuff I do. Um, unfortunately, these these are not my production computers, so I don't have yeah. any of the stuff that I do. I have a lot of. You know, honestly, I do a lot of uh, kind of like more like ambient techno stuff, just for me, how no one ever hears it. And that's more like, um, I don't know, uh, go listen to Lucy because of better than me. But, <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah? Anything else? I think uh, let's wrap it up. Thanks cool. so much for coming.